Welcome back. In this screencast, we will talk about entropy. This corresponds to uh, chapter four, 14 of the Blundell and Blundell book. Uh, this is starting to be a little bit more involved. And uh, if you have not had a chance to watch lecture 13 on the Carnot cycle, I invite you to do so before you, you attempt to uh, look into uh, this uh, lecture 14. So here in this unit, we'll talk about entropy, but we also talk about a new formulation for the second uh, law of thermodynamics in terms of entropy. And we will also talk about uh, a, a number of things related to uh, reversible um, processes. So why is the Carnot cycle so important? So let's try to remember what we did in the Carnot cycle. We showed that the Carnot cycle is the most efficient engine that can operate between two different temperatures. And uh, an engine is a, a physical process that takes heat from a hot source and then create uh, output work. And that way, what we've seen, and it's really the second law of thermodynamics, is that you can't do this unless you also release um, heat to uh, the low temperature reservoir. So the Carnot cycle uh, is essentially four processes, uh, two isotherms and uh, two adiabat. In fact, it's a cycle, so you can start from wherever you want, but usually we start from point A on this graph, where we plot the processes as a function of temperature and entropy, S. Uh, and then we find that we have first an isotherm, constant temperature, during which we get heat from the hot reservoir. And then we get to point B, where there is an adiabatic process, uh, which is, um, of course, a process where there is an expansion of gas. And this adiabatic process means that um, uh, the temperature changes, but the entropy does not change. And uh, the entropy does not change because the delta Q is zero. Therefore, the delta S is zero. This is only true because we have reversible processes. I should also. Uh, I will insist on that even uh, more as we move forward in this in this lecture. And then this is followed by another isotherm at a lower temperature and uh, during which heat is released to the to TL to the to the reservoir at temperature TL. And then finally, there is an uh, adiabatic process going back uh, to to A. And so during those points, we, we actually uh, do a full cycle. Therefore, uh, the total energy uh, does not change uh, between uh, uh, when we complete the full uh, uh, the full cycle. Of course, it, it does change uh, during the process uh, itself, but uh, it doesn't change uh, through the loop since it's a, a state variable. Okay, and then we found the the entropy S. We didn't talk too much about it. In fact, we included it. We just introduced it by using the Clausius uh, theorem. And uh, Clausius theorem essentially said something like this. Clausius theorem said that the integral of the dq uh, reversible over temperature was equal to zero over the loop. Okay, and so that meant that we could introduce um, a state variable uh, which would be written uh, as dq rev divided by t. Right. This is the definition of. Uh, of a state variable. It's one that when you integrate over a closed loop is equal to zero. So basically what it means, of course, is that if it's a state variable, the integral between two points, for example, A and B is path independent, doesn't matter how you got there. So I'd like to insist on this. This is a source of a lot of confusion in students, is that this is only true for the DQ reversible. Okay. Uh, I also like to remind you that uh, we have a special notation here for the D. Uh, this is not a, for DQ. Uh, the D is not the usual DQ that we use in calculus where we can integrate. It's, it's actually an inexact uh, differential, so we cannot integrate. Uh, there are some other notations that I use in the literature um, where you use the lowercase delta from uh, Greek delta uh, for, for this. Uh, this is also possible. Here it shows that it's it's it kind of keeps things uh, within calculus uh, notations, but modified because we don't have a, an exact differential. We'll talk about this later in a in a future screencast. Uh, 
So the fact that this path independent means that dq ref over t is an exact differential. So there must be a way physically to write this as a d of a function, such which we decide to call it s. So there must be a way to write it ds, where the d here is a proper ds, with exact differential. And the reason why it's an exact differential, of course, is because the integral of a loop is zero. And uh, it turns out this, this s, which is a new state variable that we found through this process, is, um, is called the entropy. Okay, So the entropy is really introduced through the idea of having an exact differential. And we didn't know which name to give it, so we call it the entropy. And we will understand more about this, of course, by the end of this screencast. Um, now, uh, if you have an adiabatic process, remember an adiabatic process means there is no exchange of heat. Uh, the dq uh, reversible would be equal to zero, and therefore the entropy is also equal to, to uh, the, the, the entropy is constant. So ds is also equal to zero. So basically, we can call the adiabatic process is also being an isentropic. Uh, is is like an isosurface and isocontour is the same and entropic. So it's the same entropy, iso, is, isentropic. Now let's try to 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 go a little bit. Uh, further in this. And uh, this is an important slide because here I'm going to talk about irreversible changes, which are, of course, most of the changes that we, we see. Uh, in, and uh, we see the differences between irreversible changes and reversible changes. So this is uh, the source of many issues uh, that students have uh, when comparing reversible and irreversible changes and understanding how to calculate the entropy, the changes in entropy for, for those systems. So this is this is one slide that I I suggest that you, you ponder and, and make sure you understand. So we said that the entropy is a state function. So that's nice because that means that the integral over a closed loop is, is zero. And in fact, we found that uh, a, a more general result with closed use inequality, as we demonstrated at the end of the previous screencast, that, um, that, that statement that's right there, that the uh, change of dq over t over an entire loop, so through, for example, the, car, the uh, full cycle, um, uh, will be uh, smaller or equal to zero. For, for Carnot cycle, we find actually it's equal to zero because we only have reversible processes. So in fact, we for reversible processes, we have this. So in principle, what this means, it means that, uh, I mean, not in principle, in reality, what this means is that the state function is only defined when we use the reversible process. So the, the uh, source of issues that students have is that they calculate the, the entropy using uh, dq over t, which is not correct. What is correct is to use dq rev over t. So how do you do this if your process is not reversible? Well, the good news is that because it's a state variable, dq rev over t is a state variable, that means that we can uh, use any path we want so long as the endpoints of the path are the same. And that means that if we are interested in knowing the change in entropy from A to B through a general process which, which is irreversible, the idea is to try to find an, a, another path still between A and B, but in that case, a path that's reversible, for example, with this here. So how does that help us? Well, it helps us because uh, the, the integral over the loop, of course, now is the integral from A to B of the, the actual uh, process, which is the irreversible one, so dq over t, plus the path um, going from b to a from dq reversible over t. And of course, it's correct. We go from a to b, then b to a. So we have a full uh, circle. Uh, therefore, we, uh, close use inequality applies, and this is smaller or equal to 0. Okay. So in other words, the integral of dq over t is always smaller or equal to the integral of dq rev over t. So, but remember, the integral of dq rev over t, uh, this is, uh, I mean, dq rev over t is the entropy. So we can, we, we can certainly um, write, uh, we, we can, we'll be able to use the, the entropy for the, for the second integral there on the right hand side of the inequality sign. And more importantly, um, if this is true for any path A to B, it's already true for, for an infinitesimally small path, in which case the, the integral, of course, drop. And what we find is that the entropy, which is equal to d, ds, which is equal to dq rev over t, so like here, will be always larger or equal to dq over t. 
okay? So that's, that's, that's crucial, right? That's crucial. So the entropy, the change of entropy will always be larger or equal to dq over t. Uh, that also means that when you want to calculate the entropy for a real process, you can't just use dq over t. Okay, so that will give you a bond, but that's all it's going to give you. It's not going to give you the, the actual answer. The right answer will be given by considering the, the reversible path. Uh, okay, I hope this is, this is clear enough. Now let's do one more thing here. Now the one more thing we can do is to uh, look at, uh, for example, a thermal, thermally isolated system. So why do we talk about thermally isolated system? Uh, because essentially the idea is here is to consider the universe and we are going to do that in a second. So any system that thermally isolated, in other words, it cannot exchange heat with the outside, will have dq equals zero, okay? Um, and that means, and I'm, I'm going to, to go back to the previous slide, I think it's important, uh, looking at the last inequality right here. That means that if dq equal to zero, ds will always be larger or equal to zero, okay? Uh, so if we take a system that's, that's thermally um, isolated, so cannot exchange heat, the change in entropy will always be larger or equal to zero, and in fact, it can only be equal to zero when the process is reversible, okay? So if the process is reversible, ds is equal to dq rev over t, dq rev is equal to zero, so it's a reversible process. So in that case, ds equals zero. So the, what it means, of course, is that ds will always be equal or large, larger or equal to zero. And remember where we, co we got this from. We got this from the Clausius inequality, which itself was an exact translation of the second law of thermodynamics. And remember the second law of thermodynamics, which we, we had a number of expressions for them. One of them was saying that you cannot completely transform heat into work without any other process. Another one was that uh, you cannot transfer heat from a cold reservoir to a hot reservoir without any other processes. And we, all, those, all those statements turn out to be equivalent to Clausius uh, inequality. And it turns out that Clausius inequality can be translated to this very important equation, ds larger or equal uh, to zero, okay? Now, here's something that's very important. We have a thermally isolated system. So in other words, uh, you would think that the system cannot exchange anything. So why would you have ds larger or equal to zero? Well, this is, this is the, the second law of thermodynamics. And what it really means is that ds is positive. So any changes in entropy will be positive. So any physical process will lead to an increase of the entropy. You will never decrease the entropy so long, and please, the, here, the emphasis are important. So the system will never decrease its total entropy so long as the system is isolated, okay? If you take a system that is not thermally isolated and can exchange heat with the outside, the entropy of that system can decrease, okay? But the, the entropy of the thermally isolated system cannot decrease. So, of course, what ds is going to keep growing, right, because this is a physical process, until it's maximum, right, in which case it's not going to grow anymore. So in, in other words, the entropy of an isolated system tends to be maximum, because it, all the changes in entropy of an isolated uh, system will be positive. This is crucial. This is the most important result of this entire screencast, even though we are going to keep going with more. So as I said, we can, you can now apply this to the universe. I mean, the universe is, can be treated as an isolated system that cannot exchange heat with the outside. Uh, this is something that we can, can define as the universe as that. And of course, we have the two laws of thermodynamics. The first one is the total energy is conserved. So the internal energy of the universe is a constant because there is no way to exchange heat or work with the outside because it's, it's isolated. And at the same time, the entropy of the universe can only increase. And I can even go further than this. It can only stay constant if the process that we are considering is reversible. That's a lot to unpack again, but this is basically the important thing here. So what students usually get confused about is the definition of entropy. The definition of entropy is for a reversible process. 
the, the, so dq over t is not really the definition of the ds. What's ds, the definition of ds is dq reversible over t. Okay? And we found from Clausius um, inequality that dq reversible over t will always be larger or equal to dq over t, where dq over t is for general process. We'll see that again. In fact, here we go. What I just told you, uh, here is the mathematical way to say this. And so we are going to apply this to a number of, of, of uh, scenarios. Uh, one of them uh, is a very uh, typical scenario that we've seen before. If we're going to consider time t equals zero, we have a large reservoir uh, at, at temperature tr, so r for reservoir, and we have a small system uh, s, which is a temperature, um, which is a temperature ts. Okay, and the green, uh, uh, the, the green line there is simply to show you that we put them in contact at time t equals zero. So now remember all the definition we've seen so far. This is a reservoir. If it's a reservoir, that means that you can, you, that means that it has very large, it's a very large system, or it, it has, and it has a very large heat capacity. In other words, any, you can take any heat, you can transfer any heat into it or out of it without changing the temperature. So basically the reservoir is such that temperature is constant. So that's important, okay? Constant doesn't mean that it cannot absorb heat or, or provide heat. It simply means that the, any of those changes in heat will yield the same temperature TR, okay? So let's try to see uh, where we are going with this. Now suppose that we let we, we contact uh, the two system, the, the system and the reservoir with the green the green channel there. So what happens when the time t uh, when the a large time I mean after after equilibrium thermalization, where well, we know what's going to happen, the small system, which presumably has a much lower uh, heat capacity than the reservoir by definition, will end up having the same temperature as the reservoir. Okay, and so how is that going to happen? Well, it's going to happen one of two ways. One way is that heat is going to be transferred from the reservoir to the system, and that would happen if the temperature of the system is lower, or heat is going to be transferred from the system into the reservoir if the temperature of the system is higher than the temperature of the reservoir. This is something we've seen before. And in fact, we can calculate this. Okay, we can calculate we can calculate this because this is one of the first definition we did. We when we introduce the heat capacity. So if we consider the heat capacity of the system, the amount of heat that's going to transfer from the system is simply going to be given by the heat capacity C of the system times the difference in temperatures so or the number of degrees that the system is going to change in temperature which is the definition, of course, of the heat capacity. Heat capacity is the amount of heat that you need to change the system by one degree. So, of course, the total heat that's going to be transferred to or from the system is going to be the heat capacity times the difference in temperature. And we see here, of course, is that the delta Q can be either positive or negative, which is always with respect to the system, depending if TR is larger than TS or TR is smaller than TS. Of course, if TR is larger than TS, heat is going to be absorbed by the system, so that's going to be a positive number. And if TR is uh, actually uh, lower than TS, uh, heat is going to be uh, released from the system into the reservoir. And of course, in that case, it's going to be a negative change in heat, just like we introduced a couple of screencasts ago. So basically, we have this. And we know, of course, that um, the, the system itself, which is not thermally isolated, clearly, right? The system is not thermally isolated. But we know that the change in entropy is going to be related to the, change, the, the heat transfer divided by temperature. So we know that's going to be an increase in heat, in, in entropy when heat is transferred to the system, or it's going to be a decrease in entropy if uh, otherwise. So if heat is actually um, transferred from the, from the system into the reservoir, okay? So all that is fine because we know that the change in entropy is gonna be related to a delta Q over T. Now, we can actually calculate this. 
and we can see uh, we can calculate the change in entropy of the system and we can also calculate the change of entropy of the reservoir and by doing this we know that the total change in entropy should be the should be that of the entropy of an isolated system indeed the reservoir plus the system taken together are it's a thermally isolated system because we do not allow any other reservoir to exchange heat with those guys okay so here's the way it works we're going to calculate this so uh, we introduce we enter we are first we are going to calculate the change in entropy in the reservoir and we know the change in entropy is going to be dq over t now we know because it's a reservoir by definition the temperature is constant right and the tem temperature is tr so tr is constant we can take it out and we just have to integrate dq now you can say well i can't integrate dq because there is a bar inside the d yes it's true it depends on the path we take but we know exactly which path we take right we take the path that say that we have a constant temperature reservoir in contact with the system and we already know what is the total amount of heat that's going to be transferred so delta q we just calculate we just i just introduced it in the previous slide which is the heat capacity of the system c times the difference in temperature so we know that the total change in entropy for the reservoir is going to be equal to c t s minus t r over t r and we also see that that change in entropy can be positive or negative depending if heat is uh, is going to be positive if heat uh, if 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 t s is larger than t r so basically if heat is absorbed by the system and it's going to be negative otherwise just like we expect and of course we can calculate the entropy of the system but we cannot use the exact same equation because the temperature is not constant of course uh, so we can calculate uh, this as uh, dq over t and of course we are going to remember that the change uh, when we have a system that's that's an, uh, in an isotherm the dq is equal to is equal to is equal to cdt okay and uh, uh, which is certainly true and then we have uh, for, for this particular system that we have to integrate cdt over t which is of course given us a, a logarithm okay so now the total the total entropy of the total system now which is con can be considered as um, which should be considered as isolated since we include everything that interacts with it is going to be equal to the sum of both of these which is which is this this uh, this number there this function there so the best way for this is to actually plot it. Uh, so this is this is the plot of those three values. We see that uh, the the entropy of the reservoir increases uh, linearly as expected from from the equation, while the entropy of uh, of uh, the system itself uh, goes down. Okay, goes down uh, as a function of uh, the ratio between uh, the temperature of the system and temperature of the reservoir. So what we should find is that, of course, the total entropy should always be a positive or equal number equal to zero. And here, um, this is true. You see the red curve is always above uh, zero. In fact, um, I find this a little odd uh, in this figure is that, of course, at Ts equal Tr, so at one, uh, the total change in entropy should be equal to zero. Okay. And uh, this is a plot that I got from the from the from the book, of course. And uh, in principle, the red curve should be should touch uh, zero at T s equal T r. Um, <laughs> this is a reversible process. When T s equal T r, it's a reversible process because we uh, there is no process. So doing nothing is reversible. Okay. Um, anyways, the point is that it's always positive. Uh, if I add two zeros, I certainly should get a zero. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that depending on if heat goes in the system or out of the system, we have a positive or negative uh, number for uh, the DS reservoir, the, the, the uh, delta S system. What's interesting, too, is that the two processes are different. Okay, uh, the system is attached to a uh, works at at constant temperature it's, it's attached to a reservoir at constant temperature while the reservoir is attached to a system that changes uh, heat in a non in, in, in a not constant fashion so there's a reason why the two the two plots are different what's clear is that we do not have a reversible process unless unless t s equal to tr 
So this red curve should really be equal to, should be really touching zero there at t s equal t r. So it's interesting now to go back to the to the first law, and this is another very important result that can be a little, may, may be a little um, troublesome to understand, so uh, pay attention to this. Um, what we find is that um, we know that dEU is equal to dQ plus dW, and we know that U, the internal energy, is a, 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 a function of state, but we know that heat and work are not function of state, uh, so therefore they depend on the paths that we use when when th that we use when we calculate when we calculate it. So there's a reason why we have the bar. I insist this again. Now, we've seen two things that are important: is that for reversible changes, dQ is TdS. We just did this. Remember, dS was only equal to dQ over T if, if the process was reversible. And of course, dW is equal minus PdV which turns out to only be true for a reversible process. And it is only true for a reversible process because if you go quickly in compressing a gas, for example, there will be some of the work that you do that will not be used just to change the volume, but it will be there to create turbulence, shock waves, and all sorts of things that will not uh, correspond to a change in the volume. So this particular equation minus PDV is only true for reversible change. So that means for reversible changes, du is equal to TdS minus PdV, which is another expression of the first law. Now, this is the point I'm going to say now is probably worth pausing the, the screencast to make sure that you are convinced, is that this equation is also true for a reversible change as well. OK? Now, you may wonder why this is so. Well, it, this is so because clearly du equal to ds minus pdv, if it is true for one process, it's going to be true for all of them. Why? Because u is a function of state. Okay? Now, here is the problem, though, and this is something that very often people get confused about, is that it's true that tds is dq for reversible process and minus pdv is uh, dw for reversible process. But TDS for a general process is not equal to DQ. A big portion of it is DQ, but it's not fully DQ. Okay? It's just the way that the, the different form of energy are counterbalanced in that equation are not the same for irre an irreversible process. So you can only reach that conclusion for that TDS is equal to DQ for a reversible process. So as discussed here, in fact, uh, we know that DQ um, is, is going to be e is go actually going to be smaller or equal to TDS. This is what Clausius' uh, law told us. Okay, and and of course dW will be larger or equal to minus PdV because some of the work that you would do would actually be used to do something like the turbulence. Okay, so that means that the fact that TDS is not quite dQ, okay, actually it's larger than dQ, and then P minus PdV is smaller than dW. The, both of them, actually, it turns out that the sum of them is uh, constant. I mean, is, it can account for dU. But this is, uh, uh, the truth is you can still use that equation for any process, uh, but you, the interpretation of each term, of course, is going to be different. All right, so uh, let's try to think a little bit about this equation, du equal TDS minus PDV. Uh, of course, if you recognize here uh, from, uh, from multivariable calculus, that, uh, that means that you can express u uh, as a function of the entropy s and the volume v. s and v, and in fact u, are um, extensive variable, OK? And then you, the other two variables, t and p, are intensive variable. Remember what it means. Uh, the extensive variable scale with the system, so u, s, and v, while t and p are intensive variable that do not change when you change the size of the system. Okay, This is also things that we've seen before. So that also means that uh, we can write, we can, we can just do math now and say that u depends on s and v. And therefore, I can write in all generality this equation here, which is simply an equation from multivariable calculus. Um, that gives me, of course, uh, u, uh, du as a function of ds and dv, since d s and v are the natural uh, variables. 
using the equations that we obtain uh, in the title of this slide and this equation that we obtained from multivariable calculus allow me to identify a definition of temperature and a definition of pressure. And in fact, we see that the temperature is the variation of the internal energy for variation of entropy as a as constant volume, where the pressure is minus the change in internal energy as a function of volume at constant entropy. You may say, how do I do this? How do I calculate changes of internal energy as a function of entropy? Because this is, might, might not be that easy to control entropy. And, and of course, these, these equations sometimes are difficult to, to interpret because we, do, we definitely do not have a very simple, um, we do not have a simple intuition about it. But let's try, to, let's try to take it step by step and see where we are going with this. What's interesting is that we can also calculate the ratio between the pressure and temperature, and we can do that by using the equation from the previous slide. And of course, we can use a reciprocal theorem uh, that's actually provided in uh, the appendix of the Blundell and Blundell uh, book, uh, which tell me that then therefore P over T is dS over dV. So the ratio between pressure and temperature can be obtained as the derivative of the entropy when we change the volume. Uh, that can prove to be important when, we'll, um, cons where we, where, where we want to apply this to actual problems. Where, and of course, if we do the ideal gas, we also have additional information that we can use. Very nice. So now let's try to see if we can do, uh, can make a, um, can, can apply this to a specific example uh, and understand a little bit what we mean by equilibrium. So let's see, we are going to suppose a system here uh, that one system is at a system one, which is at pressure P1 and temperature T1. And we have a, another system, which is at temperature T2 and, and pressure uh, P2. And then we are going to, to assume that this system can exchange uh, internal energy, can exchange energy, and can also exchange volume. Okay. So the question we can ask ourselves is, um, first of all, what's the change of entropy in this case? And can we understand something about the, but when that system reaches equilibrium? So these are the two big questions. So let's, first of all, let's calculate the entropy. Uh, and for that, we can use the equation that we have right here that we have, we have derived. Um, this is the equation, this is just nothing else than the first law of thermodynamics. Remember, it's du is equal to Tds minus Pdv, uh, where uh, we rearrange the terms a little bit. Okay. Um, also, by the way, that also gives you something about Pt. P, P, uh, the ratio between P and T is definitely uh, the, the, the partial derivative of S with with respect to V at constant U. That's exactly what we found the previous slide, but let's close this parenthesis and instead let's focus on this. So the change in entropy in the system can be, can be calculated quite, quite quickly since we know, we know all the information and, uh, that, we, that we need, which is of course that the change of entropy is gonna be equal to the change of entropy of the first system and the change of entropy of the second system and then we sum them. So this do sum them. So we, we do a change of entropy of the entire of the entire system. The negative sign, of course, that we see there is because if delta u goes from one system to the other, minus delta u go, go the other way, and same thing for delta v. So we are very happy about this. We are very happy because what we see is that uh, we see something very important. Remember what we said that delta S, according to the second law of thermodynamics, is going, always going to be positive. So it's going to be positive until it reaches a maximum at equilibrium. So a system will no longer change when delta S is equal to zero. Okay. So this is exactly what we see here. Uh, we know that delta U and delta V are independent variable. Uh, so as the independent variables, that means that delta S is equal to zero when the pre-factor be before delta U and the pre-factor before delta V will be equal to zero. This is the only way since delta U and delta V are independent. And so that's going to happen when T1 is equal to T2 
N1 P1 is equal to P2. Okay, so this is what's written on this slide here. So why is that important? Let's try to remember, we have these two systems initially at T1 P1 and the other one T2 P2. We allow them to exchange internal energy and uh, volume. And then we found by applying uh, the second law of thermodynamics that the entropy will be maximum. So in other words, we will reach uh, equilibrium when the temperature uh, are the same and when the pressures are also the same. So basically that, that justifies what we, we took for granted from the beginning, that at equilibrium, the temperatures and the pressures are constant. OK, so this is a direct application of the second law of thermodynamics. So uh, we are about midway through this screencast, but I think it's important to take a, a short break about, uh, about what we've learned so far. OK, what we've learned so far is written on this slide. And then we found that uh, the first law of thermodynamics is given by the first uh, equation. And uh, of course, notation give, gives us a great deal about the difference between uh, state what is what's a state function like u and what is not a state function like q and w uh, the second uh, line is the definition essentially of entropy so the entropy can only uh, this is only correct this equation is only true when we have a reversible change if you have any trouble with this uh, just put rev in a subscript for q for a while while before until you are convinced uh, this is what we did in the previous slides uh, and I, I suggest you do that if you have any trouble. If you, I, this is a most common mistake students make, is that they calculate ds using dq over t without paying attention to the fact that dq must be for a reversible process. We actually have something similar for dw, where we have minus pdv, which is really only true for a reversible change. Now we can we can decide to substitute dq and dw from from the first from the equation on the first line and get t, du equal t ds minus p dv, and it turns out that even though each piece is only true for reversible changes, the sum is always true, and again this is only tr this is always true because uh, we have a state variable uh, with u. Okay, now if we are re an irreversible process the the, the heat, the delta Q, is actually always smaller or equal to TDS. And the amount of work uh, that we need to change a volume, for example, will always be larger or equal to minus PDV. So this is something that's important to understand. It's not just so much about the knowing the equation. It's about uh, understanding their uh, interpretation. Now it's time to move to an application of all this. And one of the most important topic in, in, in the history of development of entropy is called the Joule expansion of an ideal gas. OK, so here is how it works. You have the system in A at, at initially, and you have some uh, molecules of ideal gas that are in the left container. And there is a stop there. So we do not allow those molecules to go to the right hand side. Okay. So there is a volume V0 on the left, volume V0 on the right, but initially there is a certain pressure PI on the left, and there is no gas whatsoever on the right. And then at time t equals zero, we let molecule go from the left to the right, and then that means that the entire system of all molecule occupies V2 V0, and the question is that what is the pressure that we have here? So we have an ideal gas, which is nice. That means that we can use the equation for ideal gas, PV equal RT. Uh, OK, very good. So the, and I apply this to the different volumes. So of course, the, initially, I have only V0. Finally, I have, I have two V0. Now, what's difficult to understand here is what is it clearly there's something missing, because we have uh, we do not know the difference between the temperature Ti and Tf. Now, the system is isolated. Okay, uh, That means that delta U is equal to 0. Okay, But we also know that delta U is equal to, uh, to Cv dt for an ideal gas. Okay, So an ideal gas, the internal energy only depends on the temperature. 
So because delta U equals zero, the system being isolated cannot exchange heat or work with the outside. We know that, of course, delta T is to be equal to zero. This is only true because we have an ideal gas. So the temperature are the same, the same, sorry. So Ti is equal to Tf. And we find that, of course, by applying the, the two equations can be, can, can be combined to get that the final pressure will be half of the pressure that we had to start with. So this is not a very, very surprising result, we can say, but it's an important one. Uh, it's an important one that all you have to do here is to apply um, the equation of the ideal gas and remember that delta U is equal to CV delta T for an ideal gas. Nice. So this is the start. Now the question we can ask ourselves is how did the entropy change? Uh, we didn't talk about uh, heat yet, so this is very difficult to understand if there was heat uh, involved in this system at all. Uh, and also, I'd like to, remem to remind you that um, from A to B, the work done by the molecule to go to the right-hand side is zero. Why? Because those molecules have to fight a vacuum. So have to have to yeah fight a vacuum. So in other words, the PDV is equal to zero, right? Initially, when you start the system like this. So clearly, there's something going on uh, that that's happening, and we are going to to understand this in a second. But before we go there, let's try to remember what we are trying to do. Uh, we have a, a joule expansion, and we are going to we are interested in calculating uh, the change in entropy going from the from V0 to 2V0. And the process here is a joule expansion. The joule expansion is, a, at least initially, is a totally non-equilibrium system. So it's very difficult to calculate the exact trajectory there in the PDV, um, in the PDV graph. Uh, but it's fine, because remember, the change in entropy can be calculated for any path, OK? so long as the starting and ending points are the same. This is because the entropy is a state variable. So we can calculate that. Uh, uh, we can calculate this. And of course, we can calculate this pretty easily uh, by calculating the entropy of the reversible isothermal expansion of the gas from V0 to, to V0. Now, of course, we can calculate this pretty easily because du is equal to zero. Remember, the, we, we discussed that, isothermal expansion. We discussed that on the previous slide. And of course, if du equal to zero, uh, we know that du is equal to Ts minus PdV. So if du equal to zero, Tds is equal to PdV. So that's nice because that means now that we can calculate ds, delta s as the integral of ds between initial and final. And we can replace ds by pdv over t, since tds equal pdv. Now we're in good shape because uh, we remember that we have an ideal gas. And if we have an ideal gas, p over t is equal to r over v. And what we end up doing is simply an integral between v0 and 2v0 of r v dv. And of course, that end up with r ln the 2. So the change in entropy for this particular system of the joule expansion, so remember joule expansion is a volume that goes from V0 to V0 to 2V0 of, of an ideal gas. The change in entropy will be R log, uh, natural logarithm of 2. Okay? Now, here is the thing that we have to be super careful. We have to be to remember that the actual the delta S is correct, of course. The delta S is correct because it only uh, for the system, that change in entropy um, can be calculated in using any, any uh, process we want, so long as the starting and ending point are the same. Now, the question we can ask ourselves is how does the entropy of the universe change? How does it change? OK, so here is, the, is again, something that's important to understand is that remember that my process, the joule expansion itself, is clearly not reversible, right? If you have molecule on one side, you open the faucet and let them occupy 2v0, this system is not going to uh, uh, spontaneously 
transform back into a single volume V0. That's not going to happen. So we have an irreversible process. It's a Joule expansion. So clearly the total entropy of the universe, so basically of the isolated, of a thermally isolated system should uh, increase. This particular system that we have, the Joule expansion, of course, is not a thermally isolated system. Good. So here's how we calculate this. The entropy of the gas. Uh, now, here is how to calculate. The first thing that we can do is to calculate it as if it were a reversible isotherm. So if we had, if we were able to do a reversible isotherm. Clearly, in that case, the total change in entropy of the universe should be equal to zero because my process is reversible. Remember, I'm not saying that's what we did experimentally. That's not the case. It's just that if this process were reversible isotherm, the total change in entropy of the universe would be equal to zero. So what's nice is that we already know what's the change in entropy in the gas. It's R ln 2. So clearly, the change in entropy of the surroundings must be minus R ln 2. And it's minus R ln 2 simply because we know that the entire entropy of my system must be equal to zero because I have a reversible isotherm. So this is very important. So basically, uh, the fact that the entropy of the surrounding system goes down is fine with the second law because what matters with the second law is to consider the entire isolated system. Now, the story is different if I consider the Joule uh, expansion. Because in the Joule expansion, the system is thermally isolated. So that means that if it's thermally isolated, the entropy of the surrounding does not change. The surrounding is not, there is no process uh, affecting the surrounding whatsoever, right? So that means that in that case, the entropy of the surrounding must be equal to zero. But the entropy, the, 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 the entropy of the system that we, where, where the Joule expansion takes place has to be positive. We just calculated R ln 2, which means that the total change in entropy of the universe is now R ln 2. So the, the change in, in entropy for the gas is R ln 2. The surroundings does not change because we have a thermally isolated system. Therefore, the change in entropy of the entire system has to be equal to R ln 2. Okay? So one thing that's inter interesting to do as well is that how do we, we don't have a reversible system. And in fact, if we wanted to reverse a system, we would need to do work to actually push back the molecule from the right hand side of the system into the left hand side. So we could think about how we would do this, how we, the, the, the work that we would need to calculate, uh, we need to know the path, and it's basically the, the work that we would need to provide to this would be uh, the integral between the, 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 two vo the volume 2v0 to v0 of, me, of minus PdV. We, we will remember here that we have an ideal gas, and there's a reason why we use ideal gas is because we can always change variable between each other and P is equal to uh, RT over V. And uh, that means that we can integrate this. And then we find that the, the work that would be required um, to, to, to actually get back to, to get back to the initial situation is actually T delta S gas. So that's a very interesting result, because that means that for this particular system, the entropy that we calculate uh, which is always positive for an, a thermally isolated system, is also the work you would need, I mean, is also proportional in this case, to the work you would need to bring back the system uh, to where it was initially. Further highlighting that it's not a reversible system, because if it were a reversible system, then delta S gas would be equal to uh, the delta S gas will also be equal to R ln 2, uh, but you could do this in a reversible fashion, okay? Just because the, the, entire, the, the entire entropy of the system of the universe will not change. So you can, you can ask yourself, is, this a, is there a paradox here? And here is the thing that, that's, that's, uh, that I mentioned earlier in this uh, lecture that I'd like to, to, take, to, to bring home one more time. We saw that in the Joule expansion, 
uh, we find that the delta Q is equal to zero. There is no exchange of heat. There's certainly no exchange of heat to the outside it's, since it's thermally isolated, okay? During the expansion itself, the gas is basically pushing against vacuum. Pushing against vacuum, of course, doesn't require any work because P equal to zero. So there's no work done. So delta W is equal to zero. Therefore, the change of internal energy of the system is equal to zero. And it's also the reason why the temperature did not change during this process. So that's all good. Now you can ask yourself, but if delta Q equal to zero, then delta S should also be equal to zero. So before you, before you agree with what I just said, this is not correct, of course, because this ds delta S is equal to delta Q over T only, only for a reversible system, okay? So delta S is defined as delta Q over T for a reversible system only. Of course, here we don't have a reversible system. And in fact, uh, we, can, we can see that, that we, cannot, we cannot do this. Uh, uh, and we find that indeed delta S is actually R L in the two, and uh, even though delta Q equal to zero. So this is very important to realize here that even though there is no exchange of heat, the entropy also, also increases. So delta S is not equal to delta Q over T, but instead is equal to delta Q reversible over T. Okay, so which is of course not the delta Q we calculated here, further highlighting that delta Q is not, or Q is not a, a function of state. Okay, so that, that's very important. Now we are going to move into our next section in this uh, screencast, which is about the statistical origin of entropy. So we will now uh, look at the statistical origin for entropy. And if you remember well, we already discussed a little bit about uh, uh, a statistical approach to understanding temperature, for instance, in an early uh, screencast. And we are going to try to connect everything together now. So remember that when we wrote the internal energy U as a function of the entropy and uh, in fact the volume, we found that the temperature could be defined formally as the partial derivative of the internal energy with respect to the change of entropy at constant volume. Uh, that means that, of course, that means that we can write uh, the one over T as equal to the change of entropy with respect to the internal energy at constant volume. But if you remember a very early lecture in this series, we found that uh, the temperature could be defined uh, according to the logarithm of the number of microstates. So this is something we did when we started from the point that the most likely system to, found, uh, to, to observe in, in reality was one that cons uh, corresponded to the largest number of microstates that form a macrostate. So this is what we, we did early on. So this was a principle that we used. That the, if every single microstate is equally likely, the macrostate that we will measure is the one that corresponds to the largest number of microstates. And we came up with this equation right there. Now, we, we have now understood that U, uh, the internal energy, is, is really the energy E uh, of, of the system. And now, of course, we find a, a direct relationship between S and, uh, and the logarithm of the number of microstates. In fact, we see directly that what we obtain is that the entropy is equal to K KB, Boltzmann, uh, K Boltzmann, and the logarithm of the entropy. This is a very important result, and of course, it's, it's famously uh, known to be uh, on the gravestone of uh, Ludwig uh, Boltzmann. Uh, you will notice that they use uh, uh, W instead of um, of uh, omega for for historical reason. We're not going to go there in in this screencast, uh, but it's that's one of the few people who have. Uh, an equation written on their tombstone. So that's, that's, that's interesting for the, in the history of, of science and in physics in particular. So we, we are going to, to, to see uh, how we can apply this, this description where the entropy is 
directly related to KB logarithm of the number of microstates. And we, we are going to start by looking at a system, which is a system we looked at, which is the Joule expansion of a gas, and see uh, if we can find, um, um, if we can calculate the entropy using the, the statistical method and see how it compares with the thermodynamics method. And this is what, this is what we are going to do now. Uh, I'd like to, to, uh, to tell you as well that uh, here we are, going, we are working in a microcanonical ensemble, and the microcanonical ensemble is one where the energy is fixed. Okay, so the, expan the Joule expansion revisited, remember, this is the, the, the schematics that we have. We start with gas that occupies only volume V0. Then we open the gate there, and we let the gas occupy a volume 2 V0. And we already calculated the, the final pressure with half of the initial pressure. And we calculated the entropy already of this system. Okay, so let's try to do. Let's try to understand how we can calculate this. So, so using the re, calculate this using the statistical description. We know that what matters is the number of microstates. So it's obviously not very easy to calculate all the microstates of a gas uh, occupying a volume like this. But what we can do, uh, what we what we want is remember what we're interested in is a change in entropy. So it's the delta s. So the question is, what's the change of entropy for a gas occupying volume V0 or, or a gas occupying a, a volume 2 V0? Well, there are different ways to understand this, but I'm going to try to explain this to you using, using a, a slightly different methods than, than the one that's used in the book so that you have a second way to understand, uh, for understanding this. So take, take a specific molecule of gas and it's occupying a volume V0. It occupies a certain number of microstates. Now, we can put a label on that uh, molecule, and we can say that that label is either left or right. So it's going to be left if it's on the left container, it's on the right if it's on the right container. Of course, initially, uh, it only molecule with a label left exist, but after we open the gate, uh, you can have left and right. So that means that each molecule have has a certain number of a certain number of microstates that correspond to the ensemble of molecules, but after we open the gate, we have those number of microstates increases because each molecule can either be left or right. So in other words, if we have n molecule, we have two to the power n possibilities for the mole, uh, more possibilities for the microstate simply because we have an additional label that can be left or right. So why is it 2 to the power n? Because there are two possibilities for the first molecule, 2 for the second, 2 for the third, and so on. So 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. So this is an increase in number of possibilities. But the increase in number of possibilities is exactly what I want, because I'm interested in the delta s. And of course, the delta s, because of the property of the logarithm, correspond to a logarithm of a ratio, right? So, so so that's ln omega 1 minus ln omega 2 is ln omega 1 divided by omega 2. So all I'm interested in is the increase, the relative increase, omega 1 over omega 2. So of course here, if I have one mole of molecule, we have Na molecule, where Na is num the Avogadro number. So that means that the increase in microstate is 2 to the power Na. So the additional entropy can simply be calculated as uh, delta S is KB ln 2 to the power NA, which of course is, is a trivial thing to calculate using properties of logarithm. And we, if we remember that the constant of gas R is nothing else than the Avogadro number times KB, we find that the change in entropy for this system is R ln of 2, which is exactly what we found using the thermodynamics property properties. So you see the reason here is we, we start to also see this idea of entropies versus disorder and, and number of opportunities. But it's really, it's about the entropy change, changes because we have more microstate in this case. In fact, the microstate increased dramatically, 2 to the power Na, which is, of course, a very large number. And that corresponds to a change of entropy of R ln of 2. Now, there is another, another system that we can, can consider. Is the, it's called the entropy of mixing. And the entropy of mixing goes as follows. We essentially have two containers uh, of one of gas one and one of gas two. Uh, 
and there is a X molecule of gas one and one minus X molecule of gas two. Well, actually uh, times N. Uh, so, so this X times N molecule of gas one and one minus X times N molecule of gas two. And they occupy a volume XV and one minus XV. X is of course between zero and one. So we have those two gases. They are uh, conserved, they, they are, they are uh, prepared at constant pressure, at, at similar pressure P at same pressure p and same temperature t and so at time at time at certain time we actually let the two gas mix and the question we have here is what is the the entropy of mixing those two those two systems so what entropy uh, happens here clearly before we start we already know one thing for sure is that the entropy is not going to be equal to zero because if the two molecule mix uh, if there is a mixture between the two molecules, uh, the, the two, the two uh, gas, clearly um, the, um, the, this is not a reversible uh, problem, right? It's, it's, not, it's not simply not going to be reversible. Well, we're going to discuss that in a few seconds. But for now, we know that it's not going to be a reversible uh, uh, process. So clearly the, the entropy is not going to be equal to, to zero, the change in entropy. So we, we basically, it's basically uh, from the perspective of gas one and the perspective of gas two, we essentially have two joule mixing processes, right? So we have a joule mixing processes for gas one and a joule mixing process for gas two. So let's try to understand here, okay? Uh, we are, this is an isothermal uh, system. So we know that, uh, uh, we, we know that we have, uh, we're going to have ideal gas. So if it's an isothermal process, we know the internal energy does not change. Uh, that means that we can write uh, TDS equal PDV. Right? Remember the, fir the first law written DU is equal to TDS minus PDV, uh, but DU is equal to, to zero because we have an isothermal uh, process. Remember, TU is equal CV DT. It's important to remember the equations that we've seen before. And, um, and of course, that allows me, if, TS, if TDS is equal PDV, that allows me to write DS is equal to PDV over T, and P over T is NKB over V. The, I'm using the, the ideal gas law. I'm not writing in this in detail anymore since we have seen this, seen this about 15 times so far. So by now, you should be familiar with this. Uh, that's very nice because uh, I can now uh, calculate this. So the entropy of mixing is going to be, uh, can be calculated using that formula, which is a very useful formula. DS is equal to NKB dV over V is always true for an isothermal process for um, an ideal gas. Uh, and of course, we can calculate the, the entropy and the entropy, the change of entropy will be the change of entropy for the gas, for gas one, which simply goes from volume XV to a total volume of V. And of course, uh, for, for X molecule, for X times N molecule. And the same process, in fact, the same physics, physical process happened for the, for the molecule of gas two, but in this case, we go from a volume one minus X times V to V, and we have one minus X um, molecule of gas two. So, uh, so this, is, this is a fairly elementary transform, uh, this is an elementary integral to, to perform. And in fact, we can we can calculate it this way, and we end up with, with a, as I said, something fairly fairly simple. And in fact, if we if we calculate the the change of entropy uh, uh, like this as a function of x, we find a curve that goes uh, goes from uh, f f from between x going from zero to one. Uh, we find that uh, we have a change in entropy like this. So let's let's try to study a little bit this this slide a, a little bit more, this curve a little bit more. The first of all, first of all, we have a maximum entropy uh, when x is equal one half, which is not really surprising because this is where we have the most mixture, if you want, the same the, the more molecule that you mix between the two systems. And then we find that the entropy in that case correspond to NKB and N2 again, just like we've seen before for the uh, joule expansion, something, something the same order, same similar. Um, so, um, so, so, so we see again that we can explain this idea of N ln of two, again, using the same idea, uh, using the statistical description 
where the number of microstates increases by 2 to the power n. Okay? Uh, remember the 2 to the power n now because we have possibilities for gas 1 and for gas 2. That means that the total increase will be Kb ln omega, uh, which I mean ln omega 1 over the omega 2, which is 2, uh, and um, the, the ratio omega 1 over omega 2 is 2 to the power n. Uh, I should say omega 1 and omega 2 in what I just said. There's nothing, it's not gas 1, gas 2, it's before and after. I should say ln omega initial divided by omega final would probably be a little bit more clear. Okay, so that's very nice. Now you see that the entropy is 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 is, is increasing. It is always positive, which is which is not not very surprising since we have a we, we have an isolated system like this. So it's it has to be positive. Of course, it is zero. Uh, if it is zero, if there is no expansion, if there is no mixture, or if it's zero, if there is no mixture at x equal zero at x equal one. Now the question you can ask yourself, and this is this is usually called as an important paradox. Uh, imagine that the two gases were identical. So you and, and imagine that you have a volume V naught on the left and V naught on the right. So for the x equal one half, and then you let them mix. Clearly, um, in that case, there is no reason why you should have an increase in entropy. Okay. The reason why you should not have an increase in entropy is simply because, well, there is no, there is no more microstate before than there were after. In fact, it's not quite true. There are more mi microstate uh, after and before than uh, after than before because we expect we, we we say that the molecule of gas are distinguishable. So the par the, the paradox here that we should that we still we have a change in entropy even though even if we are mixing uh, gas uh, of the same time if we were mixing gas of the same kind come from the fact that we have distinguishable uh, particle so distinguishable particle are usually classical particle for which we know the trajectory very well for example as opposed to quantum mechanical uh, particle which means that we cannot distinguish uh, the particle uh, simply. So you see here we have something uh, kind of a little bit touchy that we will have to, to worry about as we move forward. And, and we will come back to that in a future chapter when, in, when we really dive into the statistical uh, mechanics of all this. Okay? But the point remains that uh, the, the mixing, the entropy of mixing, uh, the, the treatment we've done is only correct so long as the molecules are distinguishable. Okay. If not, we seems to have a to be have a paradox. Okay. So let's try to let's try to, to switch gear a little bit and go back to our um, let's go back to, to the problem we were looking at in terms of uh, joule expansion. So remember in joule expansion we start with certain volume V naught. We open we, we, we kind of open a, a, a tap between the two chambers. The two, there are two chambers of same volume. We open a tap. The first one is, is full at initial time and the other one is, is empty. We open the tap and we let them mix. Okay? And so Maxwell came up with this idea of a Maxwell demon. Uh, we know that the entropy is increasing when you do this. Now, the Maxwell demon does this. The Maxwell demon is a creature. I mean, Maxwell, of course, didn't call it the Maxwell demon, but the, the idea is like this. Uh, once the system is at equilibrium, the, uh, the, the demon, which is represented here on, the, on this figure uh, that's taken from the book, uh, monitor all the particles. And uh, what the demon decides to do is that each time there is a particle that, uh, uh, that's actually on this slide, each time there is a particle that, that, that goes quickly, um, uh, and goes to the, for example, to the second chamber. Uh, it will let the molecule go in, okay? And uh, it will actually that way he can, or he can stop a, a molecule to go from to the left, or come, uh, stop molecule to go to the right. So basically, what he can do by doing this, it can the demon can basically decide uh, what molecule go to the left, what molecule go to the right, since we know there is a constant motion there. And then you can decide that uh, th by doing this, the, 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 the demon uh, can actually create a pressure difference between the two the chambers, just because it can select the molecule at with certain velocity, go to the left or go to the right. So basically, what the, de the demon has to do very little work to do this. Okay? Uh, and the question is, uh, 
uh, that seems to be weird because if we could create such a demon that could do this, uh, that means that he would be able to to to, to create a to go be uh, I mean to essentially reduce the entropy. So basically, make showing that the second law of thermodynamics is not valid because indeed we we would actually show that something that's not possible that we would not measure because it corresponds to fewer microstates, let's say, would be would be actually made possible through the intervention of the demon. So think again, just just to give you a better better explanation of this. Imagine that you just mis, um, uh, mixed a cream in in coffee, okay, and then the demon would actually essentially take uh, would actually do the opposite. Clearly, this is not a reversible system. So the demon would actually take all the molecule of milk and put them to the top and all the coffee on the bottom and would end up with having this, these two phase separations. Uh, so, so the question is, well, how can the demon create, reduce the entropy? Because it's impossible to reduce the entropy of a system as we know from the second law of thermodynamics, at least for the system that's, that's, a, that's a closed system, a, a thermally um, isolated system. So how, does, how is that possible? Uh, First of all, it has been shown that a demon like this could be made with, with very, very little work. Because, of course, if it starts to do a lot of work, we, we can explain, we, we, we see that things get a bit more complicated. And if you provide work, you can indeed decrease the, the, the entropy. Uh, but we are talking about spontaneous effect. So people came up with a number of examples. And in fact, if you look at different books, you, will, you may see uh, uh, explanations that are, that are changing slightly. Uh, but the thing is, uh, <clears throat> initially, there was an idea of explaining that in order to do these experiments, you need to actually observe the experiment. And by doing that, you need to, 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 to bring in some, some work, some, some internal energy. But it was proven that as an, that was not a, a viable explanation. Instead, it turns out that this is, an this is an example showing that what is really happening is that you have an, you need to to keep tab tab on the uh, on information, uh, and so there is actually an entropy of information that's uh, involved here, and the demon has actually to to uh, create entropy in terms of information that he needs, and that the the way it's working is because each time the 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 idea is actually related to do, to deleting information so removing information from from the from the process here and by doing this the demon is actually increasing the entropy of information and this increase of entropy uh, counterbalance whatever uh, idea of entropy that you would decrease by uh, by its, for example creating a pressure differential between the two chambers with with the demon so basically the idea is that this thought process uh, so thought experiment with maxwell's demon uh, does decrease the entropy of the gas itself, but the entire system, and remember we have to consider the entire system, uh, does in fact, does not decrease its entropy because there is an increase in information, entrop entropy of information. So this is something that, uh, that's becoming extremely important these days, especially with the idea of quantum computing and uh, uh, Shannon entropy and all, all those concepts. That will be treated in a in a future uh, screencast uh, corresponding to the chapter of the book. Okay, so let's it's time now to to move to the to the last topic I want to talk about in this screencast, and this, this is related to the entropy and probability, and we are going to push a little bit further with this equation of s equal to kb ln omega. Okay, so um, the problem with that equation, as nice as it looks. Um, the problem with omega, the number of microstates, is extremely difficult to measure. In fact, in all honesty, it's impossible most of the time. Uh, this is just impossible to, to enumerate or, or to consider every single microstate. So very often, uh, thermodynamics being primarily an experimental uh, science, uh, we have to rely on what you can measure. So what you measure is not the microstate, but it's a macrostate. So the microstate, just to remind you, a microstate corresponds to, to the intimate information you have of a, the component of your matter. Uh, 
versus a macro state that's a system in equilibrium that can be described by function of states such as pressure, temperature, volume, number of particles. So, so basically, again, uh, the good, the, the advantage is that um, we are dealing with logarithm on the right hand side. So the logarithm means that um, if we, we, we have specific rules that the num if the number of microstate increase by a certain factor, that means that the entropy increase, uh, there is an, addit an additive uh, increase uh, to the entropy. Let me explain to you what I mean here. So there is essentially an entropy that's related to the microstate and entropy to, uh, related to the macrostate. So suppose that you have a, you have a system, okay? Uh, let's suppose that we have a system that's described by five states that can be measured. Okay, we can measure the five states. And so we know that the entropy according to, 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 the, to the, Boltzmann, uh, the, the Boltzmann equation from on this tombstone is S is equal to KB ln 5, since we have five states. But it turns out that each of these states, and this is not something that, that I know from experiment, but each of those five states correspond to actually three microstates. So um, that's just that just it. We 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 cannot measure those. We measure the macrostate, but we learn later that those we can actually describe this by each macrostate being described by three microstate. So in other words, those what you what you actually have in your system is not five micro um, five states. It's actually fifteen states, fifteen uh, possibilities, and that means that the total entropy is in fact. KB ln 15, okay? And in fact, those ln 15 is ln 5 times 3, right? Five macrostate corresponding to, with, with three microstate each, so it's 15. So that means that I can write my total entropy as being the entropy that I measure, that I measure, so S, okay, which is, which is the, the, what I called about the, the, the macrostate that I actually measure uh, experimentally, plus the, the entropy that corresponds to the microstate, so what you can't measure, which is actually you can't even enumerate. Okay, so the, in other words, what, what you do is that the total entropy that you have is an entropy corresponding to the macrostate and an, an entropy corresponding to the microstate. And of course, the beauty of logarithm is that the, this product of number of states um, is translated into a sum that we can separate the contribution for microstate and contribution for microstate. Okay, so that was just to give you the idea of what we are going to do now. So let's try to let's try to do uh, something here that that's important. Okay, so suppose that we have uh, n microstate. Um, okay, we have a system with n microstate. Remember uh, the coins when we had 100 coins, and then of course. If we have 100 coins, the number of microstates is 2 to the power 100, right? This is the microstate. I have n of them. Well, it turns out that this microstate can be described into a series of macrostates. And just to keep this example of the coins, uh, with the the 100 and what macrostate is that is the number of tails versus number of heads. So, for example, it's going to be zero tails, 100 heads. One tails, 99, and so on and so forth. And there are 100 and one possibilities of those. And we know that 2 to the power 100 would actually correspond to a certain dif a num a different number of heads or tails. Okay? So, and, and this is going to be different. So, in other words, my 101 possible macro state, so again, the number of heads and the number of tails. Uh, I'm going to label those 101 with the index i, okay? And each of those macrostates will be made up, can be realized with n i microstate. So, for example, zero head, 100 tails. There is only n one is equal to one. There is only one possibility, okay? Uh, we, and so on and so forth. All right. Okay. So basically, we we have all those microstates extremely difficult to enumerate, but we can put them in categories which are called macrostates. Good.
Now, we know that each of those microstates have, have an equal probability. That's kind of the starting point. But the probability of a, of a macrostate is, of course, not the same. In fact, because each microstate is equally probable, the probability of the macrostate i is nothing else than the number of microstates in that macrostate divided by the total number n. So pi is equal to ni over n. And again, this is not very uh, difficult to see that by the definition of ni, the sum of pi is equal to 1. In other words, it's indeed the probability distribution, uh, discrete probability distribution that, that's OK because it's normalized. Good. That's very important to understand this. Now, we know that the total entropy is still Kb ln of n. Uh, but now, what's nice about this um, is even though we cannot measure n, because it's just too large number and too many possibilities, we can now separate n into the different macrostates uh, macro using the equation sum of i and i equal n. And it's what we are going to do. So let's do this in all uh, generality now. So the idea is we want to separate the total entropy that we have looked at uh, so far, but with a component that's related to the, the, the macro state, and we are going to call it S without any index in the indices. So uh, it corresponds to macro state, and we do not put an index because this is something we can measure. Remember, a macro state is really an, a macroscopic realization of a system. And each of those macro states have an, an entropy that is uh, due to the microstate component of those macrostates. So uh, if you have trouble with this, I invite you to go back to the slide where we had 15 realizations, uh, but we can only measure five, but each of those five at three, you know, that's what we did two slides ago. Now we made it a little bit simpler in that slide uh, two slides ago by just saying that each macrostate was at three microstates each. So it made it easy. Here, we are going to do something more general, where the S micro will actually in introduce, include all the, mi the, 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 the entropy, um, um, how the entropy uh, increases for the microstate, but even if they are in a different number for each microstate. So the contributions will all be accounted for. So the, the most difficult equation on this slide is the next one is the S micro. So the S micro is actually equal to, uh, to the sum of I, PI, SI. Now, SI is not the entropy of the highest macrostate. It's the entropy of all the microstates in that macrostate, in the ice microstate. So of course, imagine that now you have a system that exists in a given macrostate I. So don't, forget, don't worry about anything else. You know that the entropy of that system, so you just work with that particular system, for example, in a micro uh, canonical ensemble, that the, 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 the entropy is, of course, related to the logarithm, KB logarithm of the number of realizations for that microstate, which is exactly SI. SI is KB ln NI, NI being the number of microstate that realize uh, the microstate that I'm interested in. So of course, I get a microstate there. So I get that entropy. And obviously, the contribution to the total entropy will be that entropy SI times the probability of finding it's kind of the expectation value. So this is the reason why S micro is the sum of I of PI SI. So in, in what we did before uh, with the example of 5 and 3 and 15, uh, with the PIs, the, the P1, 2, 3, 4, 5 were all the same. It was one fifth. Uh, and, but the, and, and also the SI were all the same. But now things are, have changed uh, because uh, we, uh, we, ha we can allow for a different number of microstates for each microstate. Okay, so I, I invite you to try to work it out with, on an example if you, if you have trouble with this. But now we can write the, 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 the entropy we can measure, which is S without an index. And of course, it's equal to S, the total S minus S micro. And one more time, this is related to the properties of the logarithm. And when you, when you uh, um, introduce what we've calculated so far, uh, 
uh, both from the definition of the statistical definition of entropy and what we just described as the total contribution of the microstate, we end up with an entropy which is given by the Gibbs expression for the entropy, which is a very important definition uh, because it's actually something that we can measure and can handle. I mean, it is something related to things we can measure. And the, that entropy is minus Kb, and we sum over all the macrostate of the probability of that macrostate times the logarithm of the macrostate. So this is this result is 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 central uh, because it allows us to to make predictions and and actually uh, experimentally important. So let let's try to see a little bit where we go with this. Um, so uh, suppose that we have uh, omega macrostates. And each of them have a probability uh, pi is equal to 1 over omega. And here we assume a micro canonical ensemble where the energy is conserved. So, uh, so they have all an equal uh, probability uh, pi 1 over omega. And of course, we can use the Gibbs definition of entropy, which is S equal minus Kb sum over I pi ln pi. Of course, the pi is uh, 1 over omega. Uh, and so we can, we can do things very easily. OK. Um, and uh, now what, what, what happens is because we said that all the probabilities were the same, uh, the sum of i, it, it's a sum of i of, of constant, right? Nothing depends on i there. So we have omega term in that sum. So we end up, of course, with minus kb ln o and over omega, which is, of course, kb ln omega. So this is actually not surprising. This is just giving us the entropy that we would expect from a system that's made up of omega states. Now, this is macro state because this is just the, 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 the entropy that corresponds to what we can measure. The total entropy corresponds to, of course, that piece of macro state and also the piece that, that comes for the micro state. So that don't, don't forget how we got uh, the, Gibbs, um, the, the Gibbs equation. That's, uh, that's where we uh, can actually uh, conclude this, this very important uh, and fairly long screencast uh, on entropy. So we studied a lot of things on entropy today. Uh, we found a definition of another, and a definition of entropy, which is ds, uh, which which is defined through is differential. So s is entropy. ds is dq reversible over t. I can't insist enough to say that you can only calculate this for a reversible process. Uh, you cannot say that ds is equal to dq over t in all generality. Okay, So that's very important. Uh, we also found a couple of other definitions of, the, of entropy, s equal kb ln omega, uh, where omega is a total number of microstates. And then Gibbs, there was a, a general definition of entropy due to, give, to Gibbs, and it's related to probabilities of things that we can actually measure. So there, the accent is put more on the, mac, the macrostate. Uh, but we know the connection between all this, right? This is what was provided a couple of slides ago. Uh, more importantly, the entropy of an isolated system will only will always uh, increase. Uh, so we'll tend to a maximum, and that maximum can be attained at equilibrium. And we've seen an example that, for example, in, uh, thermalization at equilibrium, there is no longer changes in entropy, and this is where the temperatures are uniform and the Pressures are also uniform. We see so that in the example. So all in all, the laws of thermodynamics are that the internal energy of the closed system is constant. So we call it the universe. Closed system thermally uh, it cannot exchange anything with with, with the outside, basically. Uh, and then of course the entropy of the universe can only increase. But a, a subsystem that's actually in contact with the surroundings can see its entropy decrease. That's totally possible. We can see that we can combine all this by using du equal TDS minus PDV. Uh, this equation is always true. Now, what is not always true is that TDS represents the change in, in heat, dq. It does not. TDS is equal to dq only for reversible process. And minus PDV is equal to DW only for a reversible process. But because U is a function of state, we can write, we can calculate the changes in, uh, in, in internal energy using this equation, but we can no longer interpret TDS as the heat transfer and minus PDV as the work.
Um, this concludes this, this screencast, and uh, I hope it was clear and that you've learned a lot about entropy uh, and you enjoyed it. Thank you.